Hello and good morning and welcome to our panel, Get What You Give, The Rewards of Music Mentorship, presented by Perspective Forum and Film Music House. Uh, this is the first of four live panels this weekend. Uh, we'll have a showrunner, music executive and music supervisor panel later today at 1 p.m. Pacific. And then tomorrow morning, we have a very special guest, the one and only Richard Kraft, who will talk about his career and uh, his work as an agent. That's at 9.30 a.m. Pacific. And then at 11 a.m., a scoring for animation panel tomorrow. So please check the Perspective Forum page on Facebook for these panels and also 10 more pre-recorded panels that we are posting today and tomorrow, all very um, you know, it's a combination of workshops and panels. And at this point, I would also like to thank the awesome Perspective community for making this happen, but especially uh, all the uh, dedicated administrators who get the site going. Most of all, Adonis, who helped us tremendously with this event. A huge thank you. Uh, what we like to accomplish this weekend with those workshops and panels is to talk to composers, to music supervisors, executives, and have them give insights that are not necessarily uh, techniques or scoring techniques, but additional tools they have learned over the years and they like to pass on like meditation or how to prepare a piano, uh, songwriting, etc. So please check out all the events. And now let's start this panel. And I'm happy to have two awesome guests with me here today. Um, they have several things in common. Uh, first, they're both super amazing composer composers. Uh, they both won Emmys. Earlier this year, they both won an SCL award. And they both made it a mission to always take time for young composers and to mentor them. And uh, most of all, they're both uh, the most generous and kindest people I know. So please welcome Lolita Ritmanis and Carlos Rafael Rivera. Hello, hey. Lolita. Hey, great to be here. Hey, Carlos. Hi. So before Hello. I hand, on, uh, hand off to you, uh, Lolita is going to talk to Carlos for the first half hour or so. And uh, then I'll come on around 11.30, 11.35 to take audience questions. So please, if uh, audiences, if you want to put it in the chat room or just in the Q&A room, uh, there is a button on the bottom right. And you can ask Carlos, you can ask Lolita, and I'll take the questions later. But without further ado, this is Lolita Rizmanis. I hand it off to you. Thanks again for doing that, and I'll see you later. Bye. <laughs> well, it's such, a, it's such an honor to be here, Carlos, with you. Um, thank you to Perspectives and to White Bear for, for having us. And what an incredible topic. Um, I was reading researching you a little bit, although I, I was very familiar with your work, but I thought I'm going to find out something interesting about Carlos. And I really did not know how much mentoring you had done uh, in or and continue to do. Um, and there is a quote that you that I found of yours that you what that says, having spent the better part of my life making and teaching across musical genres, I know of no other way to so deeply feel the wonder of being alive. And I just thought it was so incredible that you included teaching in that in that. And can you maybe let's just start a little bit about let's talk about that. How how does how does teaching impact you as a composer and and this idea of having the a wonder of being alive? <laughs> First of all, thank you for this and everyone that's thanked Adonis and the folks at Perspective and thank you uh, to Thomas and White Bear and, and what a privilege to talk to you actually. So I'm just grateful that you're asking me any questions and I'm getting to like interact with you at all. So thank you. Um, I think I think that line came, I think there's a Yoda line I can't remember, but it's like from The Last Jedi that I forget what he says at some point where he says, um, he burns this tree down and looks like, but you burned whatever. And he goes, oh, it's just, they're just books or whatever. And then he says something about students, there are students become what we could never be. They're supposed to be better than us. And I think that's been something when I heard that, I was like, that's, that's the goal, that's the gig. And, and I've always thought of teaching as the career. I was, you know, along with the dreams of getting to write music for stuff, I always thought, well, if I get to do music at all and teach music and share music, that's gonna be, 
that's you know that's the end game for me not not like well i fell into teaching because you know it's rough out there <laughs> which is kind of like a sort of mentality you can have but i've been teaching uh since i was like could drive a car because i would i would teach privately guitar to people here in miami when i, I grew up in miami then i moved to la and i came back here like 10 or 11 years ago and um and so my first you know, income was like teaching, going to someone's house and 20 bucks an hour or whatever it was and, and teaching them guitar in probably the late eighties. And, um, so teaching was always like just part of the thing. And I always liked the idea of getting a chance to get in front of a group of people and share something I really loved, loved or liked or was into because I think we've all had it and you probably had it when you went to school and you learned there are kind of like two kinds of teachers. They're the ones that you get lucky to have. And then there's the rest, you know, and there's the kind of teacher that when you, that you'll remember probably the name of the teacher that said something that just shifted you, right? They paid attention to you in a certain way. And, and that kind of changed your life or changed or altered the course in which you thought things were going to go. And, and that was really one of the big goals of my life was to get to, to be in a situation where I could share what I love and try not to lose the passion that we all have when we're students, right? Yeah, it's a. I, I think that's a really great point. The, the The passion of being a student. I mean, I hope to be a student until the day I die. Exactly. Because as soon as I as soon as I lose that curious, that inquisitive kind of part of me, mm -hmm. um, it's also a, at times it's this feeling of, oh, am I always going to be the student? When do when am I going to be the expert and know everything? And and yeah. decade passes and another decade passes and all of a sudden you realize, wow, my kids are, you know, approaching 30. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm having a great career. I get to I get to do this with you. And mm -hmm. I guess I can I can wear both hats until the day I die. And I think it's fantastic that um, I don't know if, if our viewers, our participants realize that you actually taught guitar to the director of Queen's Gambit. Is that yeah. correct? Tell us about that story. I mean, how absolutely amazingly cool is that? Well, to keep it to keep it in line uh, with, you know, the idea of teaching, like if, you know, it's through teaching that I got to have this conversation with you and it and and got to meet Scott Frank. And the the short of it, well, I'll make it, I guess, sort of rather somewhere in the middle if you start getting bored just you know do some sort of zoom call or something or <laughs> interrupt me or turn me off or mute me but uh, never, i'll try to keep, no i'll try to keep it brief like like i was i was at a point where i had gone to usc to get my uh, master's degree in composition and like classical composition and then i was also collaborating with a guy called randy coleman and we had a band called zoo story and we got signed and when we got signed i wasn't quite done with the master's degree so I, I went up to the chairperson of the department. I don't know if he was a chair at the time. I think he was my composition teacher, Donald Crockett. And he was like, hey, um, you're young once, so maybe you should take this record deal and get out of here for a while. And he never said stay. He was like, go. And I, it was like the best advice I could have ever gotten. So I went and it was like a three year journey of ups and downs. And it was like amazing because I had all this money suddenly and then I had none. And all of a sudden I was just like really trying to doing different kinds of jobs. I started building websites, doing all kinds of work. And I had breakfast with him and he, and he said, Carlos, have you thought of finishing your master's degree? And I was like, no. And, and he, and he said, well, maybe you should just have that recital. Cause all I was missing was a recital and get to it. And so once he brought me back to that, I had the recital and he goes, have, have you thought of getting your doctoral degree? And I was like, no. And he's like, Maybe you want to do that. So I really owe him so much because he kind of helped shift my path from like becoming this, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life at 30 something. I was like 33 when all this was happening or 32 or somewhere in that neighborhood. And all of a sudden it became focused. And with that focus, I made the decision to, to just make money making music. And it was just like very clear to me. I was like, I, as long as I get, because life had already happened at me by then it, I had been heartbroken with the record deal going South and everything not working out that I, I was like, you know, if I get, if I get a chance to, um, to do this, I'm going to just stick to music. If I can be connected in any way through music, I'll do it. And teaching, which is the first thing I started doing, I went back to. So I shifted back, went to get the doctoral degree 
um, and started teaching privately. And one of my private students was Scott. And that's like 17 years ago. It's a long time ago. And I walked into his studio and I saw the posters on the wall and he had already, he was already a very well-established writer. And I was like blown away because he'd done Minority Report, Out of Sight, and um, all these other films. And, but I never thought of it as, you know, like, oh, here's my chance. I, you know, does that make sense? It, but, know, isn't, like, but isn't that, isn't that generally the case? Because you yeah. were, you were doing what you do with passion and you were just being yourself and comfortable in your own skin. And you were there and you got to know you, you it wasn't a motivated like this, this will be my path to success. But uh, as far as to the film scoring world, for um, sure. What was the first? But that was, uh, Queen's Gambit wasn't the first project with him, was it? It was no. Yeah. It was a Walk Among the Tombstones in right. 2012. It was like almost like 10 years after I had already known him and taught him guitar. So it was a. It's not like, you know, you you meet someone and then, then like the world. Some people's life changes can change overnight. But this was never. I never thought as a career opportunism to be teaching scott i got lucky to teach him and through the first five years or so we became like friends but it, it, i always felt like i was teaching music not guitar to people like you know it wasn't like it was a musicianship class because along with the suzuki guitar that i was teaching to kids at the pasadena conservatory i also started teaching like the history of the beatles and because i love the beatles and i was like can we talk about the beatles so i did a whole beatles history class then uh, can we talk about film music? And because I was such a fan, still am, of course, a fan of film music. I created a, a film music class. I got to teach it with a guy called Bruno Kuhn, very cool guy. Um, and we co-taught this class at the Pasadena Conservatory. We had a platform, we had people interested, and we taught it. And so I always was involved with the idea. I, the biggest idols for me, you know, teaching-wise, have been always like Joseph Campbell, who who uh, has done this amazing stories like you know the hero of a thousand faces uh, um the, the 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 oh my god i forgot so many other things but the 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 power of myth and other other stories and books is amazing and then of course leonard bernstein and when i was studying composition i saw and i read the unanswered question the lectures at harvard and just i loved the way in which he talked about all these different things and something like emulated like you emulate anybody or anything you love i was like a fan of them so having a platform through teaching to do that was, you know, was the way. And and so my lessons were always kind of multifaceted as opposed to, you know, the scale. Let's do scales mm -hmm. now, if that makes any sense. It's con it's connecting to the to the human being and the spirit of, of that human being that that actually to all of us, that the reason we can create. Um, I know for myself, um, I have been so fortunate to, to, to have some incredible private students this year. And um, and also do a residency, and these students, students, these composers are just kick yeah. ass, amazing. I am. So I think the biggest. I, I think, I think the biggest thing I've been able to contribute to their lives is not so much about okay, let's talk about what string patch you use. I mean, that's like okay, that's kind of. I'm sorry, that's a little bit boring. Um, yeah. But just to talk about how to navigate, how to navigate life, and how to yeah. get in tune with the feeling of of you are okay just the way the way you are. You don't have to follow the roadmap of okay, I want to be exactly like this and this famous composer and I if I if I join this big music house then that's going to be my ticket to success. If you can take a moment to pause and 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 really really get in tune with what it is that makes you tick. And so mm -hmm. I when I listen to you talking about, you know, these mentors, you're talking more about life things, you know. I mean, do you do you also do a do you listen to a, to other like philosophers and and that kind of thing or is that just by by chance? That was that was like what I think everybody does in their 20s. You know, like for me, I fell into Joseph Campbell in my 20s and early 30s, same with Leonard Bernstein and I fell like you all get you I think at those during that decade if maybe it happened with you as well, but you kind of start picking lanes and you kind of see what it feels like. You know what I mean? Like you put on a suit or, or a dress or whatever you put on, want to put on. And but you kind of try it on. You're like, I don't know. I don't know if this sort of like, you know, condescending idiot role works for me. <laughs> or maybe you try the other very subservient person and just maybe, the, you know, the get run over kind of personality. See how that works. And and you're not very much aware that you're doing it. You're just kind of living it. Right. I mean, it must have happened to you. I mean, you've been a student. You, you can't. I'm just. 
okay, can we just, let's flip over where you were a student of like Shirley Walker and, and that kind of, how have you felt a change from like student to teacher? Because just recently you were teaching. How has that worked for you? I'm curious. Well, I, I mean, I, I actually did teach when I first moved to LA, um, okay. I was 17 and a half and I went into the DeGrove School of Music and to supplement my, uh, my living, I, I taught piano, I also played top 40. Yes. And I just did all of this stuff, you know, and yeah. I always had two parallel paths going on. I had my kind of industry path and then my, then everything else. So I That's had, right. and so um, I really, I think, in in hindsight my shyness really was an obstacle for me at first and so when when uh so my path kind of tiptoeing in tiptoeing in through music preparation orchestrating it allowed me to be a fly on the wall and kind of learn without kind of jumping in the deep end first so it's i mean everybody's in a different space with that some people are just so charismatic and exciting right from the get go and and many of us have to carry this like 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 imposter syndrome thing like am i yeah. am i going to be found out that you know i'm just this you know this latvian kid that grew up in in portland oregon and used to hide in the corner and you know it's <laughs> like so i think um shirley was of course who for those who don't know shirley you absolutely have to research shirley walker it's yes. uh, shirley was an icon, a trailblazer. And apart from being one of the most brilliant composers ever, she was such a generous and tough and kind and everything in between mentor. Wow. So she, um, Shirley basically, I think more than music, she taught me how to, how to be comfortable in my skin and how to, how to collaborate with people and how to listen and how to like stop talking this fast and be so hyper hyperventilated <laughs> just take a breath just listen listen yeah. listen at a spotting session listen Dr yeah. ask questions be curious be inquisitive um and i just i think it's magnificent that that in this era i mean i was thinking of at, at the scl awards because the scl awards this year i just thought the the nominees the list of nominees was off the hook in all That's these crazy. categories and so many of the nominees also mentor. Hmm. So um, for our, especially for our, our our college grads whose parents might be freaking out that, oh my God, Susie's chosen to be a film composer. What is she gonna fall back on? You know, hmm. this is, I think you and I are, are testaments to the fact that you, you, you don't have to just, your path can be kind of a, Kind of a web of 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 interesting like you can be like a like an octopus with tentacles reaching out to all some different areas and that makes what what we do more interesting i think in general i think so i i agree also that you're just saying the octopus idea is something that's not said about because i don't know i, I talked about this the other day with somebody and our, our resumes are awesome right our resumes are like Mwah! they're just like as oh wow but they don't talk about all the junk that's not that 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 builds that resume and all the things that you have to do in between like i mean multiple jobs when i when you said the octopus thing i started thinking about how many jobs i did have at one point to make ends meet you know because you're committing to this thing and no one talks about the waiter the busboy the whatever it is that you're doing the valet the person who fixes computers or builds websites or fixes you know drives gear for bands and at some point, I've done some of those things throughout this this whole thing. I, I remember at one point I was working for a company called Taxi that would listen to music right. and give. You yes. know what I'm talking about? I know and that. I, I know that company. Yes. Yeah, and I had to drive out to God knows where, and I think when gas was starting to go up, uh, pretty it was becoming an expensive endeavor just to drive. But that was one of like four gigs I had. I was teaching at Pasadena Conservatory, teaching privately, and I think I was a TA at USC, and so. This is the thing is like the decision is a hard decision. This music thing, you got to be insane to do it in the first place. You know, like the one thing I have learned and that one thing as you mentioned about parents worrying about their kids, you know, going into this. What I do tell parents is like, yes, you could you're you don't you don't have to go to this institution. You don't you don't really they they can learn everything on their own. They can't like you, especially the availability that uh, places like the SEL are making and other places are doing, um, and the availability of even you know 
different like library companies like avail all this information and knowledge why would you go and spend this kind of money the the difference is this i think that when you choose to go to university or choose to go to an academic institution you're going to be surrounded by like-minded people which is maybe something that's not in the norm right now for this person who's considering it you're going to be meeting probably the people you're going to end up collaborating with or know for the rest of your life in this career anyway and if all else fails, you'll be a better person for it. Because one thing that music, and whether it's getting into pop singing or film scoring or whatever it is, makes you is a better person in the world. Because you're putting your stuff out there all the time. And you're getting critiqued all the time. And what I mean by your stuff is like you're singing or you're performing and someone's saying, that sucked, that sucked. And they're going to say, why, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And they're going to give you some advice, hopefully. Right. But you have to get up the next day after a horrible, let's say, I don't know if you've had these, but I've had it, horrible lectures, horrible uh, performances, horrible everything. And I go home and it's just I want to, you know, let go of everything and become an accountant, you know, and we have to get up the next day and we have to come back and do it again. And I can't think of any career where you constantly have to get up the next day and get in front of people again and share what you wrote and get critiqued. And in this gig of composing, oh, my gosh. I mean, revision 24, right? You know, I mean, it's like, it's what, how do you process that? And getting the grit or earning that is what makes you a better person. So let's say, you know what, I'm just done with this. There's two ways to go. You can be like the curmudgeon, you know, sort of person, ah, you know, you become cynical, which is a thing we have to fight with age. And, or, or you just go into the world, you know what, I'm going to be, I am going to be kind of, I'm an accountant. But now hearing things and being able to collaborate with other folks, it's sort of what we were being trained to do. So we are better people in the world, hopefully, ideally. So anyway. Yeah, I think, um, I think the key is um, to, if you want to enjoy your life is to not think about, I'm going to do this and this and this and this, and then I will enjoy my life. Yes. Try to enjoy try to understand that this is this is not a rehearsal i mean it's that you know this this is not a dress rehearsal this is it yeah. i don't know what happens in the next realm i really don't um but at this moment you know i have my tribe my tribe are people that i would die for that i just mm -hmm. that are my best my best friends my colleagues my absolute number one people um, for me, having gone through the Shirley Walker mentorship program, which wasn't an official program, but you know, um, the fact that I, you know, I gained my best friends, Michael McQuistian and Christopher Carter, who we then formed Dynamic Music Partners years later, but we have traveled this journey together as this team, um, mm. which has been incredible. And we are there to support one another on our individual projects. You know, when, when I was doing Blizzard of Souls, uh, Mike and Chris were just so supportive and just constantly just like, yeah, go, go, Lolita, you know, go do your sessions, do it. We're so proud of you. And to have that kind of thing, have that, that team. I think the students have that. I, I see it all the time. I see it with yes. my kids. Um, two of my, two of our kids went, uh, also went to USC. One was jazz studies, music industry, and, and, and our daughter uh, got a master's in French horn performance. And their, yeah, their gigs, their gigs and their connections are very much through the people that they went to school with. You That's know? right. It's yeah. like, so I think it's, I think it's a really wonderful thing. I see it in the, in the uh, uh, Columbia students and in Kubi's students, that these these uh, composers they 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 I, they kind of travel around as a group. I know that the, his second year students are have just arrived in L.A. and now they're in L.A. and come to L.A. Come to L.A. What about what about that? So you're in Miami. Um, yeah. I have student I have students and I have composer colleagues and directors that live all over the world. Um, right. Talk about talk about how you've how you've navigated that because that's that's sometimes I think something kind of interesting. Just just do you think it's uh, how important do you think it is to be in any one specific location? I think that it's funny that you mentioned that because I think the question is never. I don't know if it'll ever change. Like there's a couple ways to look at it. it. Depends on your personality type. I think it depends on how entrepreneurial you are. But uh, if anything has taught us the pandemic has taught us, this is a, a cliche statement, is that, you know, you can, you can work from anywhere and you don't need to be, we're a global community. And the more entrepreneurial you are about reaching out to people, about finding out and networking, 
uh, via these forums like Perspective or other ones. Hopefully, the one advice I like to give to students is start reaching out and for for students of film music, of film music, of film making, of streaming, of TV, of just look for cinematographers, look for, you know, people are going to be producers, look for people, establish those relationships as much as you're establishing your musical uh, relationships or the people you're going to lean on when things are getting rough, you know, you want to kind of start now looking at that. Um, at, at the Frost School, we, you know, we are in Miami, we've had so many of our grads from decades ago have been working in in the industry and randomly many people end up going to LA some people go to Nashville at least the popular music people I was running that program as well for a while and those students they kind of do travel in a tribe they travel like the, the graduating class go well like are you moving to Nashville me too let's go together and <laughs> yeah. then and they start that and then there's like generational thing like two or three year grads and I'm like hey reach out to these alums I know they're there New York has a movement kind of thing going on as well and LA does too. And, and I tend to keep in touch with the grads, you know, with, with people who graduated, see how they're doing. Um, but I, the answer is, I don't know. The, I would love to say it doesn't matter. Personally, for me, it, it hasn't made a difference. But had I not lived in LA in the first place, I would have never met Scott. So, um, you know what I mean? It's easy right. to say, well, it doesn't matter. But I had my pre-established relationship before I got the opportunity to work with them, even though I was already living in Miami. So, I I don't know. I, I know that um, if I was like 20 years younger, I'd probably have a better answer, you know? Yeah, it's people People ask me, but it's, I, I mean, I did move here. I had the stars in my in my eyes and it's like, I had to be in LA, even though Oregon is not that far. Um, but I do think, you know, plane rides are it, now with COVID, hopefully, hopefully becoming in our rear view mirror. Um, yeah. I think we will have learned a lot about ways to have meetings with, you know, the Zoom thing and all that. It's uh, yeah. it's not the same as being the fly on the wall because you're we're always on stage now with the Zoom thing. So That's I, right. I, I do think it's important to have to make at least make regular pilgrimages to the places where 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 everything's happening. Um, right. But you know, one thing I, I I have a feeling I suspect that that um, people listening to this would would want to hear your thoughts about. Uh, what what would your advice be to the the student that you know you already said meet cinematographers and editors but you know mm -hmm. indie film indie film route or or coffee route uh, bringing coffee at the big music uh, production places and eventually printing stems or whatever and then yeah yeah you know it's so funny I am learning um, I did okay so I did a when I lived in LA in 98, I did a mentorship, not a mentorship. Let me rephrase that. I did an internship and it was at a time that it was my first summer between my master's degree. And I think it was maybe 98, summer 98. I'll be wrong, but whatever. And I ended up calling what was then called, uh, not remote control. Was it what's remote control now? Oh, media ventures. It was called media ventures. Yeah, it's and, remote now, yeah. yeah, it's remote. And so I called media ventures. I go, you guys are looking for interns. And they're, and they're like, yeah, sure. If you want to come by. And wow, I just, was it? Yeah, like, sure. I mean, now it's was, like 300, 400 letters. Yeah, it's like, the, the, but that's how old I am. Let's put it that way, right? And then, and so I showed up and it was a great experience for me because I was sort of a fly on the wall. But at the time, I was also studying classical music. So I had a different sort of, this is like, you know, I'm learning how to film music, this is how it works. And I, I was able to get Jack in the Box for Hans Zimmer. I was able to meet some really kind people who later were assistants. We're doing that coffee route, you know, and some of the people, and I remember specifically Justin Burnett and Nathan Barr, who's a really well-established composer. I had a, because we would hang sometimes with different folks, right? Especially with the assistants, right? And I remember I had done some sort of recording on classical guitar and I had a cassette because back then cassettes were a thing. And they took this cassette and they made a CD for me and printed it back when CDs were unaffordable, like when you couldn't get a hold of a CD burner. So they burned it and it and it had my name on it. And I was like, oh my God, thank you so much. And they, I don't know, they just did it to be kind. And I've never forgotten that kindness, you know? So my experience was watching the process happen. People were kind to me. Mo Nakamoto was Hans Zimmer's assistant. And I always, she was just like, the sweetest person ever, like ever. And and she was like, hey, somebody needs to get their car fixed. Maybe you, you want to try to see if you can help them because maybe you get a chance to, you know what I mean? She was looking out for the assistants, right. you know? And so 
but I didn't have my mindset on doing that because I was doing the classical thing. And, and I was right the year before I got signed, like I was telling you before and felt when, you know, so, but, but I do think the, the answer, hopefully now that took, that took like a two or three minutes out of everybody's life. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the answer should have been anything that you feel like you is comfortable. Like, I don't think there is one path. If you've noticed, if you follow your path, what you've gone and done or mine or anybody's some people come up straight up through that thing some people come straight up and have a horrible experience and have to pivot so you know what i mean and it just doesn't work for them it's it because this is a business of personality relationships is a chemistry that also has to be uh, uh dealt with and what you were talking about how you work on preparing the students for life as opposed to just their technique or their ability craft is like 20% of this, I think. I think, I think it really, Well, right? I, th I think you know, I need my craft for, for the writing purpose um, because That's I, right. you know, uh, people say, oh, how can you be inspired every day to, to, to write five minutes of music or however many minutes a day? Like, right. well, I do have to rely on my craft. But I, um, when I, when I really was in this like out of school, fresh out of school kind of thing, I, I, I didn't have to take one job. I did, I was the, octopus with tentacles and that led to incredible opportunities i mean for for me the michael Kamen experience was pretty pretty off the hook That's um crazy. it was at 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 times i was just completely judgmental like how can he have not not have this cue done but then i would realize oh he's meeting with the director in the next room and they're talking about things and yeah. and and he'll get the cue done and at that time, then, you know, there were some of the some of us that actually had to transcribe the music. It was there, you know, this is pre pre DP. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. But anyway, I learned so much. And I was thinking if I had not been over there in Encino at his at his studio, then I don't think I would have like the main I wouldn't have the main title of Robin Hood Prince of Thieves on my on my wall because I, I co orchestrated like the first 10 pages or my orchestration because he had to sleep before he conducted the next morning. So it's like those <laughs> kinds of experiences happen because you are at the right place at the right time. That's right. And you're ready That's to right. go. So I see Thomas. Hey, Thomas. I love that conversation. And yeah. I like, I, I know we have so many audience questions, but we could go on okay. just with the two of you for hours, but I also want to make sure we get to some of the audience questions. Uh, but before I do that, I want to say hello to the two of you from the perspective administrators and from Adonis who just Great. sent a note and he's like, he wants to make sure that I also thank you for doing that. So thank you. And let's wave to Adonis in Cyprus. Hey, Adonis. <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first questions, uh, and it, the questions are for both of you. Uh, how can someone find a mentor and what is the best way to uh, go about that? And how do we approach a composer about being uh, becoming a mentor? Lovely, and I guess yeah. also an, an assistant in that sense. Well, assistant, I think, is, is one thing. Mentorship, well, I, I actually would say you can certainly, you can pay for private lessons for, from a teacher. I mean, not everything has to be, not everything has to be pick the top 10 grossing film composers and just work for them. I mean, look at, look at people who are writing the music that you love, who have had longevity in their career and see if they teach privately. That's one route. It doesn't have to, have to just be like, oh, please, please, I'll do anything for you so I can be a fly on the wall and learn that way. I mean, all the times that I was, um, I, I, I took private lessons um, from teachers and then when I was actually working for other composers, I was being paid. When I was writing for other composers, I received cue sheet credit. So my, my story is maybe different a little bit than it is now. So I, I say you, you reach out to composers whom you admire. Don't send them a 45 minute demo. Don't tell them all about yourself. Just write them, write a, sh a short little something or, or call them and, and, and tell them how much you like their work, contact them through their agent or something. It does just don't don't burst it all out in one big. It's just too much because honestly, I don't know, Carlos, how many uh, people approach you regularly. But I mean, I know there's some people, some composers that just can't answer. They just can't answer all those all those long emails. If it's a short question right. or a short compliment, you'll get an answer. So right. Carlos, do you no, have I, I, yeah, I think no, I think it's funny because I mean, my the, I was put on 
the mentor program, like I got into it and I, I coached a couple people like two years ago, like on this, on the uh, perspectives mentorship. And I think I stayed on it. So like a few weeks ago, I got like a bunch of r requests and I had to write back to them and said, listen, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I was, I meant to, I was doing this before, but I'm not able to do it now. Just send me, if you have anything, send me an email and just send me stuff. And if I can critique it, I'll do it. But the steps of mentorship, I haven't been able to get on. However, you know, whenever I have someone reaching out about that, I will save their email and I have like a list of people. And when I can, I do write back to them and I say, hey, you know, just checking in. But someone like, for example, Trevor Morris has has really kind of stepped up into that. If you have someone saying, hey, I'm ready to mentor, take that opportunity. Carlos, like, Trevor's going to be inundated now with another. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of yeah. knew that was going to happen. I'm just trying to get <laughs> Trevor. Who, el who else? Yes, who else can we get? Um, I, but, no, but no, but, reaching yeah. out, to, reaching, reach out. I would say reach out to the, re reach out, if you're interested in orchestrating, reach out to the orchestra orchestrators who are orchestrating the, for the projects that you find interesting. If you are incredibly great at programming, I mean, don't look at just at the very top person because you will actually, by becoming somebody, becoming an intern's uh, mm -hmm. assistant, Yeah. hey, you know, I think that's a great, you know, look, uh, alumni thing too, like, like we were talking about earlier, you know, reach out to your peeps that are working for other people. That's for sure. The alumni thing I notice, even with some students who have gone on to work and assist other composers, their network is aware that they're doing that. So they're, hey, if they need help, they kind of go to the people they know. It is a relationship thing. But I, I everything you said is fine. I don't, I don't think I have anything to add to it. I think you were just great at, at how you presented what they should do. Um, it is a, it's a, it's a process, and hopefully. You know, everybody finds their way. It's just I do think there is a weird line where you want to make sure you're not crossing it. And I think you also said it, so I may be redundant. But, you know, don't, don't do the long thing. Just focus on the person you're interested. And for the love of God, don't just reach out to these people because they have a name. Study their work. Know what they do. Right? Right. Yeah. So, I'd like to add, uh, you know, you mentioned Trevor Morris and the Perspective Mentorship Program, uh, which... Uh, um, people can do on their Facebook page and apply for. But then there's also other organizations, the Alliance for Women Film Composers has a mentorship program that usually starts in January and uh, applications are open in the fall. The Society of Composers and Lyricists has a mentorship program for composers and songwriters. There is ASMAC for orchestration. There is, uh, you know, the programs by ASCA, BMI and CSEC. So be resourceful. And also, uh, you know, I cannot stress enough, get out of the composing world. You know, you might also want to do a little internship with a picture editor or, you know, a script. You know, this is a collaborative field we're working in. And I, I really find it very important not only to do mentorship with composers, but to also learn other parts of our industry that I think might get you jobs, but also help you with understanding where a picture editor, a director, or a music editor is coming from so so yes that's great um another question i consistently find myself making great music when i'm emotionally invested in it some part of me tells me this isn't a healthy way to approach my craft especially if i'm wanting to do full-time composing i'd love to hear your thoughts about this so if you're not emotionally invested in a piece in, in work uh do you still do it and how do you how do you, how do you go about that? Lolina. Oh, I was going to say Carlos. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. What's the politically correct thing to say is, of course, you have to be emotionally invested in everything that you do, but there's maybe that one cue where it's just, it's just, you know, the scene is poorly edited or you just know everything's going to, it's just, it's not happening. And so you have to save it. You don't really like it. So find something, find something about it that can draw you in. It's like, think I, I have been hired to make this, make this better or to add something to it. So use it as a challenge. Don't think, oh, this, this, this scene sucks or yeah. this film isn't very good. You know, think about, you know, you've been chosen. What an honor that is. And, you know, if you honestly, if you struggle with that kind of thing of not being emotionally invested, I don't think that this, I think, I don't think this is the business for you, really. I mean, you are not going to be, you are going to have to be 
to face a firing squad of of studio executives uh you know if you're doing like kids animation you might even have opinions from the toy companies you're gonna have uh, wow. music uh supervisors in, in, giving input directors producers and they may not all agree either so wow. the easiest thing for them to do if they don't like what you're doing is just to hire somebody else so being being engaged being interested and 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 getting getting kind of past your own insecurities with that thing of the, with the needing to be so emotionally invested. Of course, you want to be emotionally invested. So just l- latch onto something, Carlos. You must have some some stories to tell. No, I mean it, I think it's the same thing. I I do notice that there's a sort of a theme emanating from the questions in a way. It's like when you're a student and or you're starting out, music in your perspective feels like it's the center of the universe and music is the sun and you are the sun around which all these other elements the director the producers and the suits and the and this total you're a you're a satellite around a moon around a moon and then there is the the sun is the people who are financing this always and and so your self sense of self-importance is kind of something that you have to learn to throw out the window as soon as possible. And it, and it, and it's, I, I'm glad that I'm 50 doing this work now because 20 years ago, I, I would have probably been insufferable or probably wouldn't have lasted because you, you have to realize that this is not about you and, and you are not your music. And if you learn that, and I'm still learning it, um, you become better at this. It's, it's a craft. It, I don't think it's art. I, it's hard for me to say that I'm an artist or I think that there are moments and things that you do that you can look back, and go, that's, I think that's pretty artful that could be considered. But if you're thinking from the beginning that I'm an artist and I'm going to do this and unless the muse comes to visit me, I can't create a gift to the world. You're kind of screwed, I think. <laughs> and I, I think you have to learn to make the craft the the focus like good at what you do version 27 of a queue no problem let's go because it's not about you you're we're a service industry we are always serving someone else's vision and that's the first thing to kind of address regarding the question you had about um if i'm not emotionally invested invested it's not about you it's about how good are you at making someone else care um yeah i could keep going because this is like i want to have i wish this wasn't water Let's put it <laughs> but I, I wanted to just want add one more thing because both you and I also have in common the fact that we write music for the concert stage. Yeah. And so there's a, there's what you do. So you know you you should never as a composer if you feel like it is wearing you down and you just hate what you're doing, a you're you're in the wrong business. But if yeah. if you are if you learn how to collaborate and and be excited about working with filmmakers. That's one part of your life. It doesn't mean you have to turn off the part of your life that at midnight you have this great idea for this incredible song or you get a commission from an orchestra. Please do that. And and if during hiatus, during times when you don't have that, that's the best time. I actually yeah. say, I think some of my biggest accomplishments have been passion projects that I never thought would turn into any kind of, you know, public accolades. I mean, I just yeah. did it because I, I had to do it. So. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and no, I, th- I think one thing, you know, I mean, I, you know, there's one thing not being emotionally invested in a specific queue or, you know, in a project. And, you know, there's always the opportunity to say no if you feel like this is not that I'm connecting with. But I think there's also, you know, this uh, philosophy of, of, of uh, you know, in the past few weeks, you know, talking to Miriam Cutlow, Wendy Blackstone, who really crafted their careers, for example, in doing documentaries because that not only fulfills them on a music level, but also their passion for activism, for storytelling, for making a difference in the world. So, you know, I think, you know, the a composer career, there's so many uh, paths you can choose and, and, and options to do for work. So maybe, you know, if maybe the horror genre is not where you emotionally invest, that maybe then you want to pra- find a different piece in that composing career. It doesn't mean you have to give up, but you know, there's so many options. So 
you know, your passion for life and for activism, for example, and composing can marry and you can do that. And yeah. while you go there, you might, as you said, Lolita, do work beside composing for film and television and write for the concert stage or for a ballet or for a fashion show or, or just for your friends. So you fulfill that need that you might not always fulfill with the paid gig. That's what I And plus, that's a, cool, that's a coolness factor, actually. I've gotten some <laughs> gigs because of like, oh my God, you had a piece at Carnegie Hall. How cool is that? It's like, okay. <laughs> No, we it's super hire. cool. Yeah, it's kind of like <laughs> that. And or, if you, or you can get a commission. I think um, it was interesting. I, I'm not going to say who told me this, but there's a, a colleague of mine who said, with concert commissions, um, this composer gets quite a few. And 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 it was, well, sometimes I, it's a coffee cup commission, and sometimes it's mm -hmm. a, you know, actual yeah. monetary. So as long as you're getting a, co a cup of coffee from the person commissioning the work, I've been commissioned to write a cello concerto. Exactly, a cello no concerto. Gonna, no one's going to ask you if you're making a thousand dollars a minute, or you you got a really good cup of Starbucks. You know, no one's going to ask. <laughs> No, but I, I love what you said, you know, by following your passion, you know, I think, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, Blizzard of Souls is such a great example where you did this independent film, uh, you know, foreign film, and then you're on the Oscar shortlist, you are, you know, your, your, your work is performed at Lincoln Center, Carlos, Cincinnati, you know, uh, concert halls all over the world, you know, it's by following, you never know where it's going to lead. So I think you have to do a combination. Yeah, you have to look for money, but then also those passion projects, they, you never know where it's going to lead. Mm. Uh, next question. You both talk about mentoring new students and talent. Do you find yourself taking inspiration from these new students and working it into your own music? Jack asked that question. Lolita. Okay, <laughs> Carlos. It's going every time. Every well, time. I I will say some. I mean, these um, the four private students that I had um, this semester, uh, USC private students: Yiren, Wang, Jamie, Mario, and Muye. Um, I was I was well, my jaw was on the floor a lot of the times at these less at these private lessons. It's like, oh my god. How great are you guys? You guys are just amazing. And so that's when I kind of um, I was it's more like a kick in the pants. It's like, oh, my God, I better I better step up my game here. These uh, <laughs> these kids are just going to just outright me. I better I better work really hard. Um, I mean, the technology is so incredible now, too, that people that have a good that have, you know, you can get stuff to sound really good. I think it's it's less there used to be a big chasm between the people that the students that would graduate and they have these crappy sounding demos. I mean, these things sound, they're pretty incredible. I mean, uh, kids coming out of Berkeley and, 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 and Frost and, and, and Columbia and, um, oh, mm. Jeff's, what's Jeff's school called at Eastman? Jeff Beale school, is that the film scoring program? I mean, the, 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 yeah. the film scoring the program. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's amazing. So of course, inspiration, but more, I, I actually, I learn more about myself because I kind of see some of the, some of the vulnerabilities in the students. I, it kind of, it, it takes me back to how I felt back then. And that's where I mean, I'm going to, I'll get all emotional because I think, gosh, if, if I can actually, if I can, touch somebody's life in the sense that they feel okay about what they're doing or they have, they feel like there's a safe space to, to talk. Um, it, it, I think it makes me a better person. So I, I'm, I'm always, I'm very grateful to, to the students for, for sharing their heart because it, it makes me a better person and a better composer. That's what was beautifully said. Yeah. I, I, I agree a thousand percent. I, I mean, teaching for me is, is one of the things I really do get. I do get most of it. Um, a couple of things. Selfishly, I do stay somewhat current with what they're listening to because they're always 18 to 22 or whatever. And the grads go up to 30 or whatever and or around and some are older. But um, but I'm always listening to music that otherwise I wouldn't be listening to. Uh, second of all, I also know I love the fact that when we have projects and we have like 10 students in the class, I'm listening to, for the same scene, 10 different versions of a cue. And so I am learning. I'm learning from what I am considering to be the mistakes they're making. I also try to empower them to learn to critique, and I empower them as much as I can to learn to take it. And it's a brutal room. Uh, I try to be as brutal as we can because we do kind of keep saying that it's about the music. This isn't you. And 
because what you because as you've been through so many of these, Lolita, you know, like you said, I, I love when you said firing squad, right? And it's sometimes a toy company that's giving you the notes or you're like, what is this? You know, th getting used to the fact that at the end of the day, you're going to have to change it. Period. You know, you have to, you're going to have to do it. You're going to have all, all is said and done when you just vent it out and lashed out or whatever, you get home, you're going to have to rewrite it. And that kind of concept, under getting that in their heads, and is is really important, I think. And I and I think I also, you know, I get to share with them all my all my mistakes, and and so I that's the best thing I can do. I do think that if I were to go back in time, and I you said that when you you wish some people told you certain things when you were young, but maybe sometimes people did, and you just weren't ready to listen. I do mm -hmm. think that the best experiences are the ones that when you run into the wall yourself, no matter how many times that you've been told that, you know, and, and getting to witness that is also something I get a lot out of. And, and it, it, it's, it's just, a, I, I love the process. I, and I do get so much out of teaching. So I'm, I'll shut up. Um, Carlos, can you elaborate a little bit uh, what you just said about criticism? Because we have a question about that and, how do okay. you personally best take criticism and do you ever defend your composis compositions or do you always change no. your work based on the notes? Yeah. No, I think, I think it's the best way to go. I think the best way to go is just change it. it, it nothing is precious. And the sooner you learn that nothing is precious, the, you can't, you, first of all, I think the, the safer thing to say would be to stand, pick the hill you're going to die on, right? And it's got to be a hell of a hill. To, to die on because the truth is you're not the maker of the story. You're helping whoever is hiring you to tell the story and you do not have the perspective that they do. You do not see it the way they do. As much as you want to, your job is to try to bridge that gap as much as you can by collaborating, communicating, understanding. But if you if if you start going like, well, you don't understand, I picked a minor key for this because I had a major key presentation when they were doing well. Now they're doing badly. This and you start going down this musical reasoning for why you're just being insecure about having to redo it. Do you know what I mean? Just do it. Just shut up and write it. I mean, that's that's the what it comes down to this. You just have to deliver and make the client happy. And 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 it and it's and it's and it's that's, it goes back to the other thing that we're so stuck on it being art because you can't touch it because because it's it's ephemeral and and it's music but it's it's just a skill like any other skill and the more you work on it the better at it you get and and believe me I, I've come to this realization for me I'm not saying it should be some people want to say no I do art that's what I do great. That's good, but I did, I did ride that horse for a long time, and I fell off too many times to try to get back on it anymore. <laughs> and I just realized I just make things, and if it gets approved, great. And if it stays and has some some for some reason, it kind of goes past the project. That's a blessing, man. But if you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna make art now, it, you know, you're you're kind of in for it, you know, pretty pretty early on. It's gonna hurt a lot more. And and anyway, sorry. Just save your, save all of your, make sure your nomenclature is clear and save every revision, know which cut you're working to, because things will That's come back to haunt you in the weirdest ways. Uh, on Blizzard of Souls, there was one cue that uh, the director didn't really like that much for a particular scene. And then I get um, close to the final, close to the final cut and they've tempted in some, that cue in a different spot, chopped it up and it's like, wait i think that's something i wrote for this other scene and so i had to i i was able to retrace it exactly and find my sequence and you know but they wanted it exactly the way that they had edited it and so and that comes back to haunt you also on the on the original scene there are times where the director or producer have to go through their own evolution and of thought and they'll go back you know what I, we like the version march that you sent us on march 2nd you know it's like if you've changed your sequence <laughs> <laughs> and haven't done revisions and incremental revisions and saves and documentation of what was what you're going to be in trouble. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's a great great comment. Great advice. Thank you. We have a few more questions trying to get through all of them. Uh Lolita, okay. are there exercises or disciplines you recommend doing every day no matter what that help you consistently to learn and improve? Um yes. I go walking for five miles in the morning. I 
have dinner with my husband. I talk to my children. I have a calendar. If I have to write certain, I have a calendar of when I'm writing and what I'm writing. And I stick to that. And those exercises actually help my writing. Um, that kind of discipline of schedule, because um, the greatest joy is to have time to write something and write something really beautiful for, for as far as creatively that's but if I've painted myself into a corner where I, I feel miserable I don't I I'm I haven't exercised I've, I've been in this room I've been obsessed with social media or what everybody else is doing and you know I get out of your studio come back into your studio and think about the art that you're creating and your collaboration that's the biggest exercise other than that, um, hey, I'm a media junkie. I love listening to other people's work. I love watching TV. I love going to the movies. You know, I just, I, I adore it. So if you if you love this business, be excited about it and learn from learn from what other people are doing. Awesome. Yeah. So you both have amazing agents, Jonathan at Craft Angle and uh, Bradley at William Moore's Endeavor. Uh, can you uh, do you recommend working with an agent? Uh, and can you can you give a little advice on that? Also, how it helps your career? Carlos, you go first. Darn it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I was no. about to do a little. You have Richard um, on tomorrow who can talk a lot about what an agent does and how it can. Help yeah, yeah, so, I, I think I'll, and, you know, how it, um, you know. Hmm. I think I think the most important thing is like I I feel like to a certain degree I'm an anomaly because I got very lucky on how I got my agent. Um, it was while I was working with Scott Frank on his first uh, on a walk among the tombstones, and I was also mentoring through USC through the, while I was getting my doctoral degree uh, through their their mentorship program with Randy Newman, and that was like a, a blessing that I was like I could die now I'm done you know because I got to hang out I got to see some sessions with him. And he was very kind to me uh, with the time, whenever he availed time, he was like, hey, come down to the studio. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to the studio with Randy. You know what I mean? And so I was total fly on the wall in that experience. But th the point is that when I started working, I was on, I didn't expect to get the gig. Then I have the job and then the producers reach out and they're like, hey, let us uh, know your agent info so we can, you know, get the contract and the deal going. I was like, absolutely, no problem. <laughs> you know, cause I didn't know what to do. And so I, reached out to uh, Bruno Kuhn, who was working with Randy Newman at the time. And I was like, Bruno, man, I have this situation, you know, he goes, hey, well, let me let me get Randy on the phone. So Randy calls me, he goes, you got to talk to my son. I'm not going to try to imitate his voice. It's pointless. It's, it's, it'll be a fail. And then he goes, you got to talk to my son. I go, why? He goes, he's an agent. I go, really? And then like 15 minutes later, I got a call from Amos. And he's, <laughs> I picked up the phone and I go, hello. And he goes, a composer in need is a friend indeed. Uh, <laughs> I never funny. forgot that because it, it, I was like, just like the dad, you know, with the sense of humor. And, and then um, and he kind of helped me with the deal. I did that thing. And, and then two years passed and I and then our contract was up and I don't know why they renewed the contract. I, I remember getting it. And when I got the I cried because I was like at that point going, well, I had a good experience with the one movie and you know, that's, I get to tell my students that this is, you know, was fun, but then they re-upped my contract. I was like, why do they do that? And then I, and that's when I met Bradley and who was working with Amos around the time. And, and this other project called Godless came on. And then I sort of just stayed with them. Um, what I have noticed along the years is that the work should always be, or the focus of getting an agent should be to aid and abet the work you're doing. And so you have to hustle and make the relationships and bring the projects forth if you are not established. It's all you. And getting an agent will help when the deal happens. But to expect, and now I'll, I'll let the master talk or the people that know this stuff tomorrow, of course, but to expect the agent to do all this work for you puts you in a, in a position to feel let down. And if you feel let down, then you're going to be upset and you're going to, my agent said, so we it's, this is not what this is about. I think when you get yourself in a situation and create the reality by which they're going to start letting you know, hey, these people are interested, that will not happen if you get an agent at first. You have to think of the agent as being a, 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 a it'll, it's like the chicken and the egg or whatever. Having an agent helps people's perspective when they're looking to hire you. But expecting the agent to get you all the work once you get them when you're starting is kind of, um, 
I, I think it's a fool's errand to quote a cool line I've heard before. But don't talk, but don't talk, don't talk money. If you don't have an agent, get an agent, get somebody to do that talk for you. I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled yep. to be with Kraft Angle. Jonathan is, is, is an amazing agent. Uh, but, but he came to me and kind of bringing it full circle. He came to me, he heard me speaking uh, at an SCL event where we were honoring Shirley Walker and he liked how I spoke in front. And so it was like, you know, Shirley wasn't a huge fan of the idea of agents, but you know, of course we need agents at, yeah. at a certain point, but the fact that Jonathan heard me speak and then my whole, the whole film came about, um, you know, I had blizzard of souls and it was, so it was kind of an incredible experience, just that, that, how that all happened. But I tell, I tell yeah. students all the time, if you have a film, don't make sure you get somebody to look at your contract. You don't talk yeah. about money. Don't do that. You talk, you talk about creative stuff and the fun stuff. That's well, yeah. Uh, so uh, we are at the end, but I'm just wondering, we have a few more questions. Would you have 10 more minutes and I can direct them individually so you don't have to both answer them, but uh, okay. I just want to sure. um, make sure we get to all of them. So Lolita, Great. what would you look for in a composer to accept to be their mentor or you know, even if, as an assistant? What are, the, what are you looking for in a composer when you take them on to mentor them or even to give them assistant work? Well, for me personally, most of this mentoring has been through these programs. Like I'm mentoring through the Alliance for Women Film Composers. I have a men mentee, Catherine Chambry from Ireland, uh, Italian composer who lives in Ireland. I'm mentoring Catherine, uh, Catherine actually. And I'm also um, the students at USC and then Kubi students. So I have not had this situation where I take somebody on. Um, I have, um, so I'm not the best person to ask about that, but I would, my advice to, uh, would be again, when I talked about looking for work opportunities, think about what you can offer to someone, what you can offer to someone and see if that person needs that. Um, because I, I understand there's this hunger and people just want, I just want some sort of a gig. Um, if I get so busy that I need somebody to work for me and more people to work for me, um, then I will be paying you and it won't be just a, a freebie mentor thing. I just, it's this, that to, I want to pay forward what Shirley did for me. I would do that kind of a thing. So be, be exceptional, be curious and don't, and, and be humble, curious, humble, and work hard. And yeah, that's, those are the three things. <laughs> Carlos, uh, was there a music class you took during your education that really helped you in your career later on? Music appreciation. I was studying accounting and um, I took a music appreciation class and that's the one that made me go into music. Um, because there was a teacher called Jay Brown at Miami Dade College and he walked around with the score. He played the Rite of Spring, which I had not registered before. And then he played the right of spring with it. He was walking around with a Dover score, which is co scores that were published and available. And he showed this one moment, you know, that were like these two notes, you know, on paper and trombones going, Burr. but I heard this massive sound, but it was just these two little notes going down. I was like, Oh my God, that's like, that's like possible. Like to, like, I didn't even thought of it. And he, that class changed my life. So, I mean, I, I went from accounting to, I mean, a musician, I didn't think I'd even be a composer. I was just going to start studying guitar more seriously. And then I kind of shifted in all, all the way. I don't even know if that's specifically answering, but that was the class that, that shifted the, the path, if you will. Lolita, and I think we answered that already a bit, but maybe we can sum it up once again. Uh, are there different times in my career I should be looking to be an assistant and times I should be looking for a mentor or take what you can get? Take what you can get. I don't know. Um, I I would say that look for the opportunity. Take the the idea of take what you can get is is kind of that that statement kind of turns me off. So that idea, oh, I'm going to take what I can get. Yeah. <laughs> so if I were looking for somebody to work for me, it's like, well, it's Lolita. It's not uh, Hans Zimmer. I'll take what I can get. It's like, I don't know if I'd be that excited. I don't know if that's how it was meant, but probably not. But I would say just be excited, just be excited. And um, I think um, any work that you do, you'll learn a lot. And and I think Thomas, you were the one that said, look for look for opportunities with non-composers. 
I mean, my goodness, I had a, I, one of the students um, didn't get a, a grad film that I think she wanted to get, but she, she signed on as a music editor on a student film, you know, so, try to learn other things, you know, be an assistant yeah. to a music editor or, 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 or a fly on the wall in, you know, the animation department or something, you know. Well, and also get involved in organizations, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, Alliance for Women Film Composers, SCL, everyone needs volunteers and there you meet other composers and, you know, I mean, remember six years ago, the woman who score um, um, concert uh, that the Alliance put on and Catherine Choi helped out assisting and getting the, the sheet music ready and today she's the president of the Alliance six years yeah. later. So wow. all lead somewhere and, and get involved and I think also, you know, what you're talking about, this, this uh, philosophy of giving back. You don't have to be an established composer. You don't have to be a Carlos Rafael Rivera, Lolita Ritmanis, Hans Zimmer to give back. You can start giving back from day one. There's always opportunities. And I find that really important to get involved. And there's so many great organizations out there. Um, so Lolita, um, uh, so I, 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 I read the questions, I don't know how exactly it is meant. As a beginner who is intrigued by this field, I have a question about how much autonomy does a film composer have over his work? What's the hierarchy like? And I don't know if that's, and let's stay with film because I think film, television, it's a video game, it's all a bit different. So let's stay in the film world. But uh, I don't know if it's meant the hierarchy on the music side or with the director, producers, etc. cetera. Um, how much autonomy well let's i'm not really sure exactly either what the question means let's just say once you get the gig do you have do you have control over how you handle the, the music management perhaps could that be it i mean most of most deals are package deals so once as long as your music is if you've been chosen to be the composer and you have that collaborative thing going back and forth creatively autonomous you're creatively you're not autonomous you're going to be working with the filmmaker but i do believe that within the framework of whatever your budget is you have some i mean i've always had autonomy to to be able to plan you know am i going to use the, how much of the package am i going to use for an orchestra is there enough to even step on a recording stage you know that kind of thing so on that level i think um i mean that's that's if that's what the question was, I think, yeah. I mean, and, and most people, most most studios want to, you know, as far as business stuff, want to deal with with not a person, but with some sort of a corporation. So you probably need to get the business stuff in order. You need to, if you're going to have or you get some get some business advice and PR advice and all that stuff. Too. <laughs> have them call you, Thomas. You can figure it out. <laughs> uh Carlos, I think you'll be good. Beside University of Miami, what are some good grad programs for film scoring? And what should someone look for specifically when choosing one or selecting? I, I think um, the answer is very, uh, you know, it's it's pretty clear. I think uh, Kubi's program, Columbia, USC is strong because of location. NYU, has a, I think, has a program. Um, that, but it's very important to think about you know what the curriculum is i always ask you know the people that are considering uh art school at frost or anywhere to be thinking about what are you going to be doing what class are you going to have to take second semester when you kind of now put your beans in that basket or whatever i can't believe i'm like filled with like cheesy lines today beans what beans in what basket anyway but like when you've kind of committed to that and you didn't really look up the curriculum, which is an annoying word, but you have to look what the plan of study. What are the courses you're gonna be taking in these institutions? And the best way to edify yourself is to literally compare, make a list of these classes I'm gonna be taking while I'm there. I'm gonna take these classes while I'm there. And I don't wanna take underwater basket weaving. Why do I have to take underwater basket weaving? You know what I mean? Like I'm making a joke, but I'm making a point. If you do that kind of research, that's gonna be what's most helpful. I think you can go to any institution anywhere it's what you put into it is what is going to come out. I believe in the person. I believe in the individual. I don't believe in the institution being the one that holds the key to your success. I think at best what we all can do as, yeah. as purveyors of these, like looking over these programs, is to make it the most real world-like experience. Like 
I want to provide students uh, from the trenches as much as I can what my mistakes have been and prepare them for what to expect on the psychological side, like Lolita said, and the, you know, the craft side. But, but that's, that's, that can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be just these sort of places that I'm recommending. There are places in Europe I have no clue about that I'm sure are fantastic. There are, it, it can be in another state that's not one of the big cities that we're mentioning. You, it's, if the teachers are doing their job and if they have the passion and care, you're going to get a great experience out of anywhere. And you, on your own, will be entrepreneurial enough to find and create those opportunities that will change your life. It's up to you to make, you can go to any school, but if you've got what it takes, I think you know, I've seen that happen over the last 20 years in academia or so. It's always the individual that kind of creates that reality. So, Lolita, do you want to add to that as far as picking uh, education and, you know, it doesn't, it can be a grad school, but also leader, you know, there's so much. Yeah, there. you know, it's interesting because I, you know, I, I, I have like two sides of me, you know. The, the mom, the mom that was on pins and needles of like, which schools are my kids going to get into? Oh, my God. I remember junior year of high school that that misery started, you know, and there are the kids. I, we have three. Mark and I have three kids and like, oh, are the SAT scores high enough and this and that and the audition and this and that and a heartbreak and this. And, um, so really, in the long term, I don't really think it really matters. It's self-motivation. On the other on the other hand, um, certain places, there is that networking thing. You know, and I just I know, I know, especially I mean, my one of our daughters is a dancer and a teacher and she's actually teaching that's she's chose to pursue teaching. But the other the musician and the and the uh, the two musicians, um, I think they're some, uh, part of their success is because of the networking that they made at the at the more prestigious school, but I would I would advise film composers to don't wait don't I want to say waste don't put you know 50 grand plus into a grad program if you're if you go there and you don't you don't have no idea of how to sequence music or i mean do do that homework ahead of time so when you go get to this program you can just suck up all the energy and the, the, the educational opportunities but not not like well this is this is a click track and this is you know don't don't waste anybody's time and i've seen that i've seen where people go into these get into these programs and they don't know how to do any of this the basics so um, do that on yeah. your own or, or to even add really quick to that it's like if you're going there to get a piece of paper i i've seen no one get work in this industry by making the dean's list ever and so you know it's like you, you got to be thinking like along the lines of what lolita said you're there for the network you're there for the opportunities you can create for yourself so thank you again both uh, i know we ran over so i am I'm, I'm not gonna do any more questions I, i've answered some in the chat directly and the sampling question uh, i think tomorrow the animation panel would be good for that where we'll talk more about the techniques and this was more about mentorship uh, I'm so grateful to both of you for spending Saturday morning with you. For everyone out there, there's more panels come out. We start in 45 minutes with our music executive panels who will give advice to how they, uh, what they look for in hiring composers and also when working with composers, when what they're looking for. Uh, for. It's uh, the flighted and then showrunner Steve uh, Yoki, then uh, Colin Fitzpatrick, music executive from Netflix and Breaking Bad music supervisor Domos Golovic uh, on this panel, moderated by Chandler Paul Pauling. And then uh, we have some more live panels tomorrow. So check out uh, uh, Perspective on Instagram and Facebook and filmmusichouse.com. And again, a huge, huge thank you, Lolita and Carlos. Very grateful. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Thank you. Thrilled to talk to you, Lolita. Real privilege. And thank you, Thomas, for this. This is great. And Adonis and everyone at Perspective. Thank you and for tuning in. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.